Welcome back. So in the last vignette, what we did was to explore some of the hypotheses that one can formulate to try to explain what gives rise to the, the rate of cell division. And we're using the model bacterium E. coli as a window onto that problem. And what I wanna do now is I wanna talk about the huge achievements in um, in proteomics that allow us to take stock of the contents of bacterial cells, yeast cells, mammalian cells, Drosophila cells, whichever you, you might like. And the reason that this is important is when we contemplate these different hypotheses for the, uh, what, what limits the cell division time, those hypotheses, each of them implies something about the molecular census of the cell. Why? Well, for example, if I, if I acknowledge that I need to take on board 10 to the 10th carbon atoms during the thousand or so seconds of a fast cell cycle, then that means that something on the order of between 10 to the 6th and 10 to the 7th carbons need to be taken on board every second. And that in turn means that around a million sugars need to be taken on board every second. So we're going to have to ask ourselves the question, how many sugar transporters are there? And so on. So in this vignette, which is a continuation of the previous one, what I want to do is I want to lay the groundwork for thinking about what is known experimentally. So writ large, we're, we're talking about a very important question in general for, for all of cell biology and for physiology. And that is, what, it, what is the macromolecular composition of living organisms? So this car, set of cartoons is intended to show uh, some of the, the key systems that one might like to know about. On the left-hand side, we get a rendering of E. coli, a yeast, uh, and a mammalian cell. And on the lower, at the bottom near the scale bar, you can see the relative sizes of the, those different cells. And then on the right-hand side, I give you a very fast uh, order of magnitude impression of the macromolecular census of these different cell types. So there's many ways to come at this, and this one is probably something um, that I will refer to in some of the homeworks. It's a very interesting table. You know, if you were to imagine yourself on that desert island with Wilson, and if you by chance happen to have this table with you, you know, somehow uh, that, that was part of your, your, uh, your set of things that you have on the island, I think it, you could do it actually a very good job of trying to come to terms with uh, why the numbers are what they are. For example, the percentage of the total dry weight, which is protein. I think you could think that through and come up with a, a, a number that made sense like this one does. So, um, so anyway, this, is the, that, this gives us a, an impression. And um, Ron Milo and co-workers have also appreciated this way of trying to, um, to describe the census of, uh, of different systems. So, you know, I, I show it mainly just for your entertainment and for you to refer to if you decide that that might be an interesting avenue for, uh, for thinking further about the, the contents of the cell. One thing I hope you notice is the, the huge importance to the overall mass of the cell of the ribosomal RNA, which you see up there in blue uh, in the top left corner. Okay, so um, before talking about the experimental methods, here I just wanted to point out some regularities in the composition of a cell as a function of growth rate that are fascinating and that call for an explanation. So some of these things were already discovered in the late 1950s by Elio Schechter and others, and I call your attention specifically to the lower left, where what you're seeing is the DNA, the RNA, and the protein fractions of the cell as a function of the growth rate. And one thing I hope that you appreciate is as the cell grows faster and faster, the protein to RNA, or I should maybe say the RNA to protein ratio, which is shown in the upper right, actually goes up, which basically is a signal that the, the, the way the proteome is divided up varies as a function uh, of growth rate. And again, this is something that I'm gonna come back to later in the course, but for now, this is really just to whet your appetite and for me to make the assertion that in much the same way, you know, that in the early 1800s, as people like uh, Gay-Lussac and Charles and Avogadro uh, and Boyle, they formulated empirical relationships about the behavior of gases and how pressure and volume and temperature are related, ultimately culminating in the ideal gas law. Well, what you see in the lower left 
is in a way a phenomenological statement about the behavior of bacterial cell composition and so you know this kind of an empirical relationship calls for an explanation and and you know those kinds of regularities are are likely not an accident and have something to do with the the, the evolution and fitness of these cells in their environments so the the rest of this short vignette is intended to tackle the question of how it is that we know the macromolecular census of a cell. And the reason I show this particular figure is I've always been very, very excited about the ingenuity of scientists in eras where it was not possible to do the obvious thing where you just bluntly and directly measure the thing that you want to measure. I already mentioned in a previous vignette about one of my heroes, Alan Wilson from UC Berkeley, and he and Vincent Sarich in the 1960s, prior to being able to actually sequence and compare, for example, the genomes of chimps and humans, what they could do was they could use antibodies and look at how well those antibodies bound to molecules in the blood of a chimp or a human or a rhesus monkey or whatever. And I, I like to think of that, and so there was a similar thing from Linus Pauling using a gel kind of like this, where what he did was to trypsinize hemoglobins from different organisms and then to look at how those hemoglobins spread across a gel and and that was both of those are examples of genomics without the genome or geno sequencing without the sequence and so i think these old school methodologies are absolutely stunning and you know this this methodology was used by uh, calvin at uc berkeley to figure out the path of carbon through photosynthesis which is the name of some of some maybe 12 papers um, so at any rate, I'm not going to belabor this, but it's just to say that according to mass and charge, one can separate the different proteins and then based on the intensity of the spot, which in this case is measured using radioactivity, you can basically calibrate the relative abundance of different proteins. So that's old school. Um, I want to tell you about two methods that I'm particularly excited about that have been used in recent years in order to quantify the proteome. And so one of them is the so-called ribosomal profiling method. This paper, Quantifying Absolute Protein Synthesis Rates, reveals principles underlying allocation of cellular resources, is a paper that introduced this uh, ribosomal pro profiling in the context of the bacterium E. coli. So to my mind, this is one of a suite of methods that I like to think of as protect-seek, and they have to do with the very, very clever ways you know, that I, ha I didn't see coming at all, in, with which people have used DNA sequencing as a, f a biophysical tool. So all these methods kind of have in common the idea of you take some, uh, some DNA that's decorated by something or other, whether it's nucleosomes, transcription factors, polymerases, mRNAs decorated by ribosomes, et cetera, and then you digest the DNA that's not protected by the presence of those proteins. Then you release the protein in sequence, and that tells you about the abundance of the sequence that was protected. Okay, so that's that's a very clever set of ideas, and the ribosomal profiling idea is uh, is basically as follows: as you see in the top left, you have an mRNA. It's decorated with ribosomes. The idea is that, as you can see, after footprinting is. Um, is that the, the RNA that is not protected by the ribosome is digested, and so then what you do is you purify those RNAs and, and map them, and then you have a, a frequency distribution that tells you how frequently a given part of the genome is decorated by, uh, its mRNAs are decorated by ribosomes. And the reason that this is interesting is you can use that to actually, in turn, characterize the rate of protein synthesis, and oddly, to my mind, they found a very nice correlation between the protein synthesis rate as measured according to this ribosomal profiling and, as you see in Part B on the upper right, and protein copy number. So effectively, the ribosomal profiling method became a scheme for characterizing the proteome itself. So just to give you one example, this is from the, the paper that I showed you before. This is looking at the uh, synthesis rate of the various components of the ATP synthase, a topic that we're going to come back to uh, with enthusiasm shortly. Um, just to, again, just to kind of foreshadow what came out of this is they were able to tell us what the relative abundance of different types of proteins are. So you can see in this case in yellow that the proteins associated with translation are really highly represented and, 
etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Just it's again just to pose a puzzle. In other words, can we rationalize? Do we understand why this pie chart is divided up the way that it is? And that's in a certain sense what we're going to be talking about in the next vignette, where we try to calculate the relative abundances of different kinds of proteins in order to keep up with the process of cell division. So a second methodology quite distinct from the ribosomal profiling is the use of mass spectrometry. And one of my favorite papers is the one shown here by Schmidt and Heinemann in which they used mass spec. And the thing that I, I am particularly appreciative of is, as you can see in the abstract, they did this under 22 different experimental conditions. And I like the analogy of, you know, if you were to use a drone to, to, um, to take pictures of New York City, of Manhattan, it would, it would be fine if you had one snapshot, you know, that would already be interesting. But if you did it on weekends and on holidays and day and night and at rush hour and at midday and so on, you'd learn a lot more about that concept of New York City by looking at it in all sorts of different conditions. And so, you know, to my mind, this is extremely important, the, the fact that they looked at all these different growth conditions. So the idea of the mass spec methodology is that you take the cells as shown in the top, you break them open, you digest the proteins, that is to say you break them into fragments, and then you run those fragments on a mass spec. Um, I mentioned yesterday, uh, or sorry, in an earlier, the Schrodinger lecture, the, 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 um, the very large influence that uh, Hassenhorl had on him and that that particular young scientist was killed in World War I. And another, um, another one of these amazing scientists, of this, in this case a British scientist, um, was, if I'm remembering correctly, I think it was Francis Aston, and he also was killed, uh, I don't know, maybe it was Mosley, I think it was Mosley, uh, who invented these methods. He actually was able to figure out that by, by running um, molecular fragments through an electric and in a magnetic field, he could, he could bend them in a way that would allow him to identify their mass over their charge ratio. Anyway, okay, so that was a bit of a digression, but the, the main point is that the mass spec permits the, uh, the measurement of the relative abundance of different fragments, and that can be used in turn then to count. So what comes out of an experiment like that of Schmidt and Heinemann is shown here. This is a figure from their paper where what they're telling us is the protein, the total protein mass associated with various classes of proteins. For example, you can see that the metabolic proteins uh, are representative of about 100 femtograms, and you can see that with increasing uh, growth rate, the blue guys increase, and that has to do with uh, the, the processes of the central dogma and so on. Let me also note that the y-axis, again, if you're sitting on your desert island with Wilson, the y-axis is measured in units of femtograms per cell. Now, we've earlier talked about the mass of a bacterium. I said it has a volume of characteristic volume of a femtoliter. Uh, that's 10 to the minus 15 liters. And we know that the, uh, the mass of water is one kilogram per liter, and so that's uh, one femtokilogram. So, one, um, so that, that corresponds to one picogram total mass, a thousand femtograms. So the idea that the protein mass is of order, let's say a couple hundred femtograms is quite sensible. That's telling us that the dry mass is 200-ish, or half the dry mass is 150, 200 uh, femtograms. So out of this study, this is one of the, my favorite figures to emerge from this proteomic study, is the total number of proteins per cell as a function of growth rate. And what you can see is that at low growth rates, the number of proteins is of order 3 million, and at high growth rates, it goes up to around 8 million. And on the bottom, you see all of the different uh, growth media that were used to control the, the growth rate. So this is the cell census that comes out of uh, a proteomic analysis of E. coli cell. Now, one of the things that Heinemann and company did in their paper was that they examined the comparison between different methodologies. And so, you know, you can see, for example, uh, part C, which I think is a very important one, that although the trends are consistent between single cell microscopy and the mass spectrometry studies, the absolute characterization is way, way off. And um, you can see up in the upper left a comparison between ribosomal profiling and mass spectrometry, and the list goes on and, and on. I mean, the, the bottom line is that 
this is a very important point because it's telling us about how well the different methods that we have for measuring proteins in cells, how well they correspond with each other. To my mind, a very important point. In fact, to give a, a mini sort of uh, aside, I think it's very important, especially for the, the younger members of the, the audience listening to this, to, uh, to try to resist what you will see culturally about, uh, especially from referees, but even just in ca casual conversation, there's such a dedication to the, the notion of surprise uh, in science. And I'm, I'm going to give a special um, vignette on, on my rejection of surprise as a key element of how we should judge our science. But um, what comes out of this, one of the negative side effects is this belief that if somebody's measured something, then that invalidates the need or the requirement to measure it again. And I, I couldn't disagree more strongly with that. So here I showed you this in a, in a previous vignette. but the point is, is that here I'm comparing ribosomal profiling and mass spectrometry for the ATP synthase uh, complex, which is responsible for generating ATP. And I already complained about the uh, precision that's reported. And I also wanted, uh, I wanted to say that the expected ratios, and what do I mean by that? The, the ratios of the various subunits are quite flawed. And, you know, I, I wrote the authors, again, I admire this work so much. I learned a lot from doing so, but I wrote the authors and said, I thought I'd, maybe you made a mistake in labeling your tubes or something. But what they pointed out to me is that these mass spec based methods are challenged by uh, membrane parts, mem membrane proteins. So there's a hard, they have a much harder time nailing those. Um, just to show you this again, I, I showed it in the previous vignette, but I, I want to emphasize the need for different methodologies to measure the same thing and for us to ask ourselves, how well can we make these measurements? How much confidence do we have? So this is absolutely critical. So um, in, a recent, in a recent work done by Griffin Turi and Nathan Beliveau, um, they basically took stock of the protein mass per cell as a function of growth rate for all these different methods. So on the right-hand side, it's a combination. Taniguchi is the, the methodology using um, microscopy. The, um, the study of Schmidt is mass spec. Obviously, Lee, the purple ones, that's the ribosomal profiling. And all of these tell us basically a relatively self-consistent story. Um, more could be said about that, but I think I will leave it. So my last point is just to say that although what I told you about was ways of measuring the protein content of cells, the proteomic, the proteomic uh, census, one can also ask questions about metabolites, and mass spec has been very powerful in this regard as well. So where we are is that we have, um, we have now basically uh, formulated, uh, we've formulated this, this idea of, of trying to examine the what the possible rate limiting steps in in cell division for bacterium we've now we, we wrote down our various hypotheses and now what we've also said is we're in a position to take stock of the relative abundance of the different molecular players that give rise to that growth rate and so what we'll do in coming vignettes is we'll actually do the calculations that allow us to explore to what extent different molecules might be rate limiting 